In this second optional video, we're going to continue our look at unsupervised learning, clustering, and some issues in clustering, including dimensionality reduction. And we're going to look at two specific applications of dimensionality reduction and clustering in natural language processing. So in our last video, we we're talking about issues in um, unsupervised learning, in particular in clustering. We've looked at the algorithm k-means, which drops um, centers of clusters at random and then has the centers drift around the feature space so that it can anchor itself onto the center of potential clusters. This is very good when the clusters are very clearly separated. We looked at a second algorithm called expectation maximization, where if your clusters overlap, uh, the, the EM algorithm calculates a probability distribution of a dot belonging to a certain cluster. This will make it so that we don't have hard edges in between clusters, but there can be areas where the grouping can be a little bit more ambiguous, but others where it's more certain. If we have many dimensions, it might be difficult for the computer to find the clusters. We have algorithms that reduce dimensionality. Some of them are linear, like principal component analysis. So PCA will take a um, surface, for example, a three-dimensional surface, and try to figure out where you have the most variation, and then make those the new axes of, for example, a two-dimensional structure. So it uh, reduces many dimensions into fewer dimensions by finding which are the features or dimensions that explain the most variance. Those will be your new principal components. But this is done in a straight line. How about nonlinear distance measurements? How can we find um, similarity between documents where we don't necessarily have to use a straight line? There's many algorithms decide, uh, designed to do this. For example, look at the S-like object on the left. It might be true linearly that the red dots and the green dots are relatively close, but that linear assumption does not correspond to the actual shape of the object. If we followed a nonlinear trajectory around the outside of the S, maybe the linear distances would be longer, but we would have a better reflection of the topology of the object. So maybe things that are further apart in linear space are actually closer together in some kind of curved space. As you can see, there's many algorithms to learn, um, I'm sorry, to reduce many dimensions uh, in curved space into fewer dimensions in, for example, two-dimensional planes. Let's look at two of them, isomap and TSNE. Let's say we have the same object we were looking at, like a rolled-up Swiss gig-like object that looks like a six. We could describe this as just, for example, the pixels in like a 28 by 28 pixel image, like a six over there. And we could describe it as, you know, out of these 700 pixels, the first one is off, the second one is off, the third one is off, the fourth one is off, and you'd have 728 features to describe that. That is a lot of features for something that could be described more easily with a nonlinear path. For example, a curve that tells you how the six curls up. Essentially, we would need to unfurl this curve into um, something that looks like a plane, trying to find a so-called geodesic path through a curved structure. Isomap will do exactly this. It finds ways to unfurl um, multi-dimensional space so that it looks closer to, for example, two-dimensional space. As you can see there, this is again the Swiss roll, which looks like a six. And in figure A, we have what we were mentioning before. The dashed distance is shorter 
linearly. But it's actually a bad description of what's happening. The better description would be the solid curve going along the curve of the Swiss roll, as shown in B. And if we unfurl that 6 onto something that can be seen as a two-dimensional plane, we will find um, the geodesic path we're looking for and a way to have fewer dimensions, for example, two dimensions, out of something that was three-dimensional originally. Isomap is very interesting in that it is very transparent. It's very easy to know what it's doing. For example, this algorithm is popular when learning handwriting. When you give it pictures of handwritten numbers from 0 to 9, it can learn the characteristics of the numbers, and then it's very easy to understand what it is that it learned. So there's a database called MNIST of handwritten numbers, and each of them is a 28 by 28 drawing of the number. It's just 28 by 28 pixels. So each specification has about 784 features. Isomap can reduce that to two features. And when we chart it, as we see here, it's easy to understand what those reduced features are telling you. For example, when we look at the horizontal axis, it tells us that it, um, those numbers vary on bottom loop articulation. If you look at the numbers towards the left, you will see that the bottom of the two is more like a line. And if we go rightwards, you will see that the loops and the bottom of the two are becoming more curve-like. So the isomap algorithm is learning the curves as a potential dimension of interest. In the vertical dimension, it has the top arch articulation. So as you can see, and the top of that uh, dimension, we have two that have a very straight top of the two, that is where the top is more like a line. And as we go downwards, the upper part of the two is more curl-like. As you can see, the dimension that this, uh, dimensions that this algorithm learned were curves, essentially, not lines. And that's how it measures distances between objects. And this is very useful for objects that have curves, like handwriting. There's another type of dimensional reduction that we will use, which is TSNE, or T Distribution Stochastic Neighborhood Embedding. We are going to use it in our next video, where we are looking at word to vec embeddings. In summary, let's say you have something of 300 dimensions. You have the description of a word in 300 features, and you want to display that in two dimensions. Maybe your clusters are going to look like they look here, where you have a small cluster in the center and then a larger cluster outside. So it is very difficult to find a single line that can tell us how to separate these clusters. You need something more like a circle. What TSNE does is that it calculates the probability of two dots being together in the higher dimensional space, and then it tries to recreate that probability of closeness in a lower dimensional space. So if two dots are very close in three-dimensional space uh, with a probability distribution, it's going to try to make them very close in the two-dimensional distribution as well. How does it do it? With the same trick as the expectation maximization. It draws a Gaussian or normal distribution around every dot, and it calculates the probability that this dot and this dot are close to each other with a normal distribution. So very close dots are going to have a high probability. Dots that are very far away are going to have a lower probability. It creates the probabilities using a Gaussian. However, when it plots it, it uses a different distribution called the T-student distribution. It's basically a flatter distribution so that it has fatter and longer tails. 
This makes it makes it so that things are not as crowded in the two-dimensional chart, but are more spread apart. This again um, gets probabilities in three-dimensional space and recreates those probabilities in two-dimensional space. And in doing that, it recreates uh, original distances in the higher dimensional space. So for example, the relationship between the word drinking and drank is probably similar to the relationship between swimming and swam. And this relationship is going to remain equidistant, the same, in the two-dimensional TSNE chart as it was in the 300 dimensional original chart. So you're going to get a chart that looks like this, where you can see that drink, drinking and drank are roughly uh, the same distance as swimming and swam. And we're going to take advantage of this in our study of Wojtovec. So in summary for these two optional videos, we looked at some issues in unsupervised learning, in particular in clustering. We looked at how to uh, reduce dimensionality. There's some algorithms that reduce dimensionality in a linear fashion, like principal component analysis, turning a three-dimensional object into two dimensions with straight lines. There's nonlinear algorithms, like isomap, which takes curves and unfolds them into two-dimensional space. There's algorithms like TSNE that take the probability of two dots being very close together in 300 dimensional space and recreate that probability in two dimensional space. So notice that all these depend on how you measure distances in between documents, how many features do you give the system for it to learn from them, and on how you uh, determine the edges in between potential clusters. Next up, we're going to look at a very useful system to describe the meaning of words called Word2Vec.